We are starting a, a new series of messages called Messy. How many of you know that relationships are messy? All right, the rest of you are in for a rude awakening. Uh, relationships are uh, a blessing in our lives, but they can be they can be complicated. And uh, so we're going to talk about we're going to talk about relationships uh, over the next few weeks. You know, I have to be honest with you. There are there are times as a pastor when um, I go into uh, certain message series, or I know that I'm going to uh, be addressing certain topics, and uh, sometimes it's it's really exciting. You feel a, a lot of freedom uh, in addressing those topics, and then there are others that uh, when you when you know that you're coming to a place uh, to address particular uh, passages, that it can be it can be a little bit intimidating. Um, it can it can cause you to be a little bit nervous, and some of you are like, Ah, Randy, you're never nervous to be up in front of talking to people. I can tell you that when you start talking about relationships, when you start talking about marriage and family and parenting, um, it can it can be something to uh, cause you to pause a little bit. I want you to take a moment, and I just want you to look around the room. Please do that. Please just look around the room. In case you haven't ever noticed this before. There are a lot of people in this room who look different than you. I, I've, I don't know if I should say this or not. I'm going to, though, because it's so fun. So we've lived in Africa now for, I don't know, 14 years or so, maybe a little longer. And it was at some point uh, we had traveled back to the States after living in Africa for a while. I'd, Definitely shouldn't say this. Um, and uh, we got back to uh, Texas, and we were around just like, it was just a bunch of white people. And, and Desiree had a moment where she was like, oh, I, I look around, I'm like, what, what are all, what's going on with these white? And she's like, I forgot that I was white. Because <laughs> we had lived in Swaziland for so long, and there wasn't a lot of white people there. So... Look, there are a lot of people in this room that are different than you. And what that means is there are a lot of different cultures represented in this room. And when you, when you start talking about relationships, and then you go even further and you start talking about marriage, you start talking about parenting, you start messing with people's uh, culture, their kind of uh, their broader culture, and then the, and the and the truth is, I know that that I know all of you Zulu people think that all Zulu peoples are the same, but you're not. I know that all you Indians think that all Indians are the same, but you're not. I know that you Afrikaans people think that all Afrikaans people are the same. And should I, can I just keep going down the line, right? <laughs> What, what I often do whenever I do premarital counseling with a couple is one of the big tasks, one of the big challenges in premarital counseling is helping uh, this prospective couple to understand that even if they come from the same race, um, even if they come from the same neighborhood, uh, they're coming from different cultures because every family has its own culture. Um, and often we think that just because somebody looks like us, their culture is the same than us. And, and really, every family has a different culture. And so I know that when I come to a topic like relationships, when I get more specific into marriage and family and parenting, that I'm messing with your culture, the, fundamentally the way you think, what you believe, the way you see the world, and our tendency our tendency when we are confronted with people who see the world differently than us or think differently than us, our tendency is to think we're right and they're wrong. Especially as long as it works for us. 
When it, maybe when it stops working for us a little bit, maybe then we're willing to question it. But by and in large, we think that our way is the right way. And here's the thing for those of us who are followers of Jesus, for those of us who are Christians, just like I got up this morning and I put my glasses on, many of us who are believers, we get up every day and whatever our personal culture is, we put those lenses on. And even when we approach scripture, we approach scripture through the lenses of our personal culture. When I read a verse of scripture, I read a verse of scripture as a white guy from Texas. I can't help that. That's my reality. Now, a part of being a mature believer is recognizing and understanding that and taking off the lenses and allowing scripture, allowing scripture to interpret me rather than me and my lenses to interpret scripture. That's what mature people do. But the truth is, most of us, if we're honest, most of us often, especially around emotional issues, or issues that we're passionate about, or issues that are related to ingrained culture, most of us struggle to take the lenses off. And so when we talk about relationships, whatever those relationships are, like, for instance, your relationship with your boss, or your relationship with your spouse, or your relationship with your friend, or your sibling, or your child, or your parent. When we talk about relationships, it's a highly triggering emotional issue. And so if we're not careful, we will have a tendency uh, to use Scripture as a tool to adjust their behavior. We will use Scripture as an instrument to enforce what we want, we desire, or we believe in that relationship. And so what I'm going to challenge us to do and encourage us to do over the few weeks that we're talking about this is to be humble and honest as we approach Scripture. And instead of me approaching Scripture as a white guy from Texas or as a, a, an Indian from Phoenix or a, a Zulu from Durban, instead of approaching Scripture through my personal cultural or my familiar cultural lens, instead... Can we come together as honest, open, hello, people who say, okay, Lord, we want not our culture, we want the culture of the kingdom of God. I, I, don't, want, um, I don't want a Texas marriage. I want a kingdom of God marriage. I, I don't, I don't want to be a good little Zulu employee. I want to be a kingdom of God employee in my company. I don't want to have an Indian relationship between parent and child. I want to have a kingdom of God relationship with, hello? Uh, I didn't hear any Indian people say amen when I just said that right now. You guys were all just looking at me like a bump on a log. Are you with me? All right. I told you guys, this is a minefield. I'm so nervous about preaching this. Will they still love me when it's over? I don't know. Ecclesiastes verse four, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 says this. Two people, two people are better off than one. For they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Some of you, when I started talking about relationships, you're like, oh, okay, I know relationships are messy, and because they're messy, I don't want any of them. I, I've, I've been burned, Randy. I've, I've learned the hard way. I'm just going to do this on my own. Yeah, thank you. So I knew some of you were thinking this. Some of you are like, I'm not married. I don't have to worry about this stuff. Some of you are like, I'm married. I can't get out of it, but I'm just going to keep. Oh, I'm so glad you're laughing. That's good. Let's keep that up. This is going to make this go much better. Look, here's the thing. Relationship, 
uh, relationship is absolutely essential for our lives. Relationships are important and they're necessary. Um, in fact, we, we say this many times from, uh, from this pulpit, we were created and designed for relationship. Um, God is a triune God. One of the most incredible mysteries uh, within Christianity is the triune nature of God. Um, I've spent most of my life studying this, and I still feel completely incompetent explaining the Trinity because it is a complex interdependence of relationship that is beyond human comprehension. God exists in his very existence is within interdependent relationship. God is a triune God. He created us. He created us for and through and by relationship. Like literally, you biologically only were able to come into existence through the joining of, of two becoming one. Like get that, like understand that. How much more does God speak to us that we were designed in and for and through relationship? Relationship is important and important. Is absolutely important, and, and some of us have been so burned by, or we see relationships as so messy that we think, I just, you know, I'll do as much as I have to do to get by, but let me avoid as much of this as possible because it's hard, and it's complicated, and it's, it's messy. And as much as it is hard and complicated and messy, it is absolutely necessary in your life. None of us were created to exist alone. None of us. Now, before you single people start getting triggered and think that I'm referring to marriage, let me just say this and get this out of the way. You were created for relationship. Whether or not God calls you to marriage is something completely different. So don't be triggered by what I'm saying. Here at North Place, we value and celebrate your singleness. We understand scripture very, very clearly. The truth is, scripture says that you have great gifting and capacity for the kingdom of God in your singleness. Scripture celebrates your singleness. We celebrate your singleness. If God calls you to marry, we're going to be celebrating with you and we want to walk with you in that journey. If God calls you to singleness, we celebrate your singleness and we want to walk with you in your journey. So don't get triggered today. This isn't one of those places where we pretend like you're not a complete person if you're not married. That's garbage. That's not in scripture. Scripture makes it very clear you're not not a complete person if you're not married. So if you're hearing that today, that's not Pastor Andy, that's not Jesus, that's the devil trying to get you sidetracked so you don't hear what the Lord wants to say to you today. Regardless of whether or not you're called to singleness, regardless of whether or not you're married, regardless of whether or not you're a, a child living in a home, or whatever your status is, or you're a grandparent or a parent, regardless of your status today, we can all agree, and it's very, very clear from Scripture, that relationships are important and that they are necessary. The book of Proverbs actually has a lot to say about relationships. In fact, just as a, a side note, and I don't have much time for many side notes today, so I, I can't do this very often. But as a side note, I, you may not be aware of this, the book of Proverbs actually has 31 chapters. That makes it really great to include that in your daily 20 every day. My suggestion to you is that every, the start of every month, you just start the book of Proverbs over again and read a proverb a day along with whatever else you're reading that day because the book of Proverbs is just full of so much easily applicable wisdom, and it can just be a part of your daily discipline to read a proverb every single day. And the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about relationships, and so I'm going to be referring to it uh, uh, quite a bit in this series of messages. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 9 says this, perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. In other words, the writer of the book of Proverbs is saying our relationships are valuable and important to us and a godly relationship brings joy, it brings peace. It's like a pleasant perfume 
not someone who's taken a bath in it. I'm just going to let that one just have some time to marinate like some of us are doing in the vat of perfume that we wear. The pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice like perfume and scents that just in a subtle way flows into our life. Healthy relationships are a blessing to us. Let me say that again. Healthy relationships are a blessing to us. If I have healthy relationship, it adds to my life. It builds my life. Proverbs chapter 27, verses five and six says this, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. See, there's a difference between healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships. And what I want to talk about today are healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships. Regardless of your relationship status, regardless of what relationship you may apply this to in your life, I want us today to think about healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships because healthy relationships add value to us. Healthy relationships build us. People who love us and care about us help our lives to grow and develop. On the other hand, unhealthy relationships are a burden to us. That one seemed to get more amens than just about anything else. Unhealthy relationships are a burden to us. So the question, the question is, if healthy relationships are good for us and unhealthy relationships are bad for us, how do I have more healthy relationships? How do I dress, address, and how do I acknowledge, how do I know unhealthy relationships? Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26 says this, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The righteous choose their friends carefully. It's like some of you teenagers sitting over here today. Some of you choose to sit by people in church who are going to distract you. And then you get home from church and mom or dad gets on to you because you weren't paying attention in church. And yet every Sunday, you choose to sit by somebody who's going to distract you, and it gets you in trouble, right? No, uh, Josh like, nope, I always sit by. You see what I'm, this is a perfect example, right? How many of you grew up in church and you had that one friend who sat by you and they were always talking and got you in trouble? When Desert and I first started dating, I would sit on the other end of the aisle because, <laughs> oh, it wasn't because she was, I was just distracted by her beauty. It's, that's what it was. <laughs> you hear me, right? Wise people look around at their relationships and understand my relationships affect my life. And the right relationships posture me and position me to be blessed. And the wrong rela relationships gets mom and dad yelling at me in the car on the way home from church every Sunday. Hello? Oh, none of you yell at us. Okay, us. That's cool. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. A companion of fools suffer. So my relationships, if they're, if they're positive, then they're a blessing to me. But if I'm in relationship with a fool, it causes harm in my life. I have to choose my relationships wisely. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says this. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. The relationships we make and the way we steward those relationships are both a reflection and a projection. 
the relationships we choose and the way we steward those relationships, it reflects who we are, what we value, what we think, what we believe, and who we hope to become. You know the old saying, show me your friends and I can show you your future. When I'm processing with a, a leader, if I'm coaching somebody, a question I often want to ask and something I want to explore is who's speaking into your life? Who are you listening to? Who are your friends? Because if you tell me who your friends are, I can tell you your future. I can tell you the direction that you're going. Who you spend your time with determines where you're going. It determines what you think. It determines how you feel about things. And so as we start this conversation about relationships, we have to understand that you and I have to be wise enough to be good stewards of and aware of our friendships, of our relationships, of who we are surrounding ourselves with, who are the voices that we're allowing to speak into our lives. Who are the voices that we are allowing to shape the way we think, to shape the questions that we ask, and even the answers to those questions? Every relationship in your life is pointing you in a direction. Let me say that again. Every relationship in your life is pointing you in a direction. Choose wisely. Proverbs says, wise people choose one direction. Fools choose another direction. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 9 says, well, let me not read that yet because I need to say something first. This is another one of those uh, nervousness about uh, preaching this kind of message. I need to get this out of the way. One of the things that you learn as a pastor is that when you say things from the pulpit, especially, that, um, that it applies in people's lives and they apply it in their lives in different ways. But what I've learned through the years, in particular, when it comes around this topic of relationships, marriage, family, dating, parenting, I've noticed that as I mentioned earlier, we can have a tendency to take scripture and take the words of leaders in our lives or our pastors, and we can, we can weaponize those words in the relationships in our lives. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Your spouse does something that upsets you. You have tried to deal with the issue. You're not, you're not getting anywhere and so you, you pull out the trump card. Well, Pastor Randy said, and it doesn't have to be Pastor Randy. It could be your favorite TV, pre, whatever. I, it's not about me, but you understand what I'm saying. Or the Bible says, all right, let, let's reframe. How many of you have ever had that done to you? Right? Your mom or your dad did that to you. Or my favorite is when I've got an unbelieving boss at work, but they know I'm a Christian, and they don't know the Bible at all, but they know that, that one verse. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to be a Christian? Doesn't the Bible say? And they quote it like out of context and half right. But they're trying to weaponize Scripture to modify my behavior to do what they want me to do. Yeah, yeah, it's the other people, right? We never do that. Let me, just, let me just say, I'm about to run through some verses of Scripture really quickly, and I'm going to do my best to bring context to them and all this stuff. But if you, take, if you take anything that I say or any verse of Scripture that I read today, and you weaponize it against the people in your lives and the relationships of your life, in your life, then I promise you, you're, you're completely misinterpreting this message today. This is not meant... Uh, to put tools in your tool belt to modify or control the behaviors of the other people in your life. In fact, in fact, the point of this message is actually quite the opposite. You see, every relationship in my life, every relationship in my life has at least two components. 
And one of those components is me. Every relationship has at least two components and one of those relationships with me. And I guarantee you, I'm part of the problem. And if you're not humble enough, thank you, Meredith. She works with me every day. She said, yep, really loud. I promise you, if you're not humble enough or mature enough to start from that posture and that place, you are never going to have healthy relationships. If you are so culturally biased that you view your relationships through power dynamics that causes you to not have any accountability and everybody else in your life to have all the accountability, you're never going to have healthy relationships. In fact, the Godhead does not exist outside of accountability. They do everything in mutuality. If you really read and understand Scripture, they do everything. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit do everything in submission to one another. They do everything, everything in submission to one another. And every healthy relationship flows out of a place of submission to one another, which means that all of us, are a part of the problem. And a humble, healthy person understands that I don't weaponize God's word. I don't weaponize the words of others as a way to modify or control others. Instead, I allow the Holy Spirit to apply to my life truth. And out of that truth, I then bring truth forward in other people. Well, you're loving this, so let me move on to probably what will make you cheer a little bit. Proverbs chapter 1, 21, verse 9, a verse of scripture that comes up often when we talk about marriage and family. Uh, all the guys are going to get pumped up on this one. Better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> That's the kind of verses of scripture that you came here for today, right? <laughs> That's what you expected me to talk about. Because here's what happens in these kind of sermon series. It's either, and we usually save this one for Father's Day, because usually the church, uh, the, the church is usually rather masculine, and we, we pick on women and children all of the rest of the year, and then we take Father's Day and we beat the husbands up really good. So that's what usually what we do historically. Um, so we take these verses of Scripture, and we, we make everybody feel bad, and we put everybody in their place but, but Proverbs, is really, uh, Proverbs is really trying to help us to understand something about relationships. Proverbs is trying to help us to understand that when you've got unhealthy relationships, when communication has broken down, when expectations are not being met and not being communicated, hello, you can't have healthy relationship. Everybody's miserable when relationship breaks down. Proverbs isn't teaching us to beat up women and to make them feel small and insignificant and like they're the problem. Proverbs is teaching us that we're all the problem. And that when relationship breaks down, here's what happens. Everybody's miserable. This isn't a value statement about women. It's a truth statement about relationship. Proverbs chapter 27, verses 15 and 16 says this, A quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. You could, you could substitute wife, husband, child, aunt, uncle, mama, daddy, no matter. You could substitute anybody in that, and it's true about any one of us. If you've driven in a relationship, if you've driven a person to a place that they cannot be heard or felt or seen, if you've driven a, play, a person to a place where they are overboard, it doesn't matter what pronoun or what person you put into that phrase. What it tells us about relationship is it simply won't work. It's like oil going through your fingers. You can't grasp it. You can't get your hands around it. It doesn't work. Proverbs 20 verse 3 says, It is to one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. So before, before we start making these verses of Scripture about beating up women, understand Proverbs is talking about, it's talking about fools and it's talking about relationships. 
It's talking about a person who isn't emotionally healthy enough and mature enough with their own relationships and their own feelings to understand that you don't have to fight all the time. That you don't have to get your way all the time. That everyone doesn't have to see things the way that you see things. And if you're always picking a fight, if you're always fighting, you're like a fool who's quick to quarrel. On the other hand, an honorable person avoids fighting. An honorable person is peaceable. Scripture has a lot to say about being peaceable. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 21. As charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. There's all kinds of passages that have been used in Scripture that we've used as kind of gotcha passages like I was talking about earlier. It seems like it seems like we often take those and we turn those towards women when we want to make them feel bad or we turn them towards our kids when we want to make them feel bad or we turn them towards men when we want to modify their behavior. But the truth is, Scripture is speaking to all of us and it calls all of us in our relationships, whether it be a marriage relationship, whether it be a family dynamic or any relationship for that matter, Scripture calls us to a place of, aware, of self-awareness and understanding. And as believers, it calls us to a place of submission to one another. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 says this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We love Ephesians 5, and I, I don't have time, so I'm, I'm going to skip this, just letting the sound booth know. We love that Ephesians 5 pa uh, passage where it tells, wives, submit to your husband. We love that, but we skip the beginning of the chapter that says that we're all supposed to submit to one another. And we love Ephesians 5 where it says, husbands, love your wife like Christ loves the church. Baby, if you would just love me like Jesus loves me, I'd love you more. Then we, we, we re then all, all of us can get together on Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents. You bunch of hooligans. It's all your fault. But every bit of the conversation even talks about, he even, well, this will really trigger all of us in this room. He talks about slaves submitting to their masters. We talk about. All of it is predicated on this concept of mutual submission to one another. Can I say this to you? Relationship, healthy relationship is, is impossible. Healthy relationship is impossible if we are so immature that we cannot submit one to another. To the degree that you are willing to surrender yourself and to submit to others, is the degree to which you can experience healthy relationships in your lives. Some of us struggle with healthy relationships in our lives, and I'm going to get into this uh, next week, because we're still so wounded and dealing with our own identity and insecurity that we find it impossible to have healthy relationships with other people. We're fighting so much to be seen and to be heard and to be validated. We're fighting so much for that that we find it impossible to walk in healthy, peaceable relationships. Let me say it this way, skipping on down. Healthy relationships start with the gaze of responsibility resting on oneself. Healthy relationships start with the gaze of responsibility resting on oneself. So before I go to Ephesians 6 and try to adjust and modify my wife's behavior, perhaps I need to allow the Holy Spirit to adjust and modify my identity. Before I pull out Ephesians chapter 6 and try to tell my kids what they should and should not be doing, perhaps I should allow the Holy Spirit to speak into Randy's heart and Randy's mind and Randy's life about who he really is. Matthew chapter 7 verses one through six. This is one that your unsaved friends use on you all the time. Um, do not judge or you too will be judged. You've heard that one, right? You can't judge me. It's, the, it's like, y'all don't hear that. No one says that to you? 
You, you can't judge me. Why are y'all getting quiet all of a sudden? We were, la- we were enjoying ourselves a few minutes ago. Don't judge me. Let's keep reading. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? Ooh, Jesus, man, he, he doesn't play, does he? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. As I mentioned, this passage of Scripture is often taken out of context or misquoted and said, oh, we have... We, you don't have a right to hold me accountable. The Bible says, do not judge. That's not what the Bible says. Next time somebody says that to you, say, liar. <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. A more polite way is to say, I'm sorry you're misinformed. <laughs> That's not what Scripture says. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying... Jesus is not saying you have no right to hold the other person accountable. In fact, Jesus is saying quite the opposite. Healthy relationships include accountability. Healthy relationships include accountability. Accountability is only effective. This is what this passage is saying. Accountability is only effective when it is a two-way street. Here's the problem with healthy relationships. The problem with healthy relationships is when I try to hold you accountable, but there's no accountability in my life. When I try to make you an Ephesians 5 wife, but I'm not an Ephesians 5 husband. When I try to raise Ephesians 6 kids, but I'm not an Ephesians 5 parent. Kids, teenagers, that was your time. Like, you were supposed to be like, woo. You can't have healthy relationship without accountability. And accountability doesn't work unless it goes both ways. All right, let's get off of our families because we're, we, don't, we don't want to make anybody upset. Let's talk about our, our, our work relationships, right? We can laugh about them. How many of you have ever had a working relationship with a boss or a situation in which accountability was only a one-way street? Like you would get the memos and you would get the emails and you would get the dirty looks and you would get the, right? And they could tell you what to do, but they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. You better show up for work on time or they're going to dock your pay, but they come strolling in late every day. Oh, now you're, I'm getting you, I'm getting you back. I'm winning you back. You're there. You got to follow the rules and the policies and the procedures, but they can do whatever they want to do. Hello? We're on the same team, right? Accountability only works when it goes both ways. And here's the problem. It's a problem with many leaders is many leaders try to hold people accountable when they themselves are not accountable. And maybe, maybe in an organization it doesn't work for you Somebody I'm leading to hold me accountable, but I have to model and demonstrate that there is somebody that is holding me accountable. And the degree that you know that I'm held accountable is the degree to which you can trust that you can, that you can uh, live under my accountability as a leader. And that's why many, many leaders want to be kings and they don't understand that that's the problem. That's where the breakdown is in their relationships. 
when we try to manage, we try to lead other people, we have to model and demonstrate accountability because accountability is a two-way street. It works with parenting. It works in our relationship with our spouse. It works in our relationship with anybody in our life. We have to understand. And what Jesus was basically talking about in this passage is the problem. The problem is when I'm in a relationship with somebody and I want to point out all of their faults and their problems, but I don't want to allow for the bandwidth of the issues in my life to be dealt with. And ultimately what that comes down to is a person rejecting my voice, a person rejecting my influence, a person rejecting my, my what I have to add to their life. And they ultimately say, you're a hypocrite because, because on the one hand, you want to point out what's going on in my life. But on the other hand, you, you live with all of these things going on and you just pretend like they don't exist. What Jesus is calling us to is a place of humility in which we acknowledge our own behaviors, our own sin, our own problems. John chapter 14 verse 15 says, if you love me, this is Jesus talking, keep my commands. Have you ever ever read that passage before? Some of you are really holy and righteous and you would never, ever, ever think something like this about God uh, and so good for you. But I I, I read this passage. my whole life, and there was a part of me that was like, okay, Lord, help me to understand this. You're saying that I don't love you unless I keep all of your commands. What is that? Because what that makes, it feels like to me, somebody who's, who says, do everything I tell you to do, or you don't love me, that, that kind of sounds like a megalomaniac, right? That kind of sounds like a distorted relationship. Sounds like that person's crazy. Have you ever had anybody in your life that they said, you have to do everything I say to do the way I say to do it or you don't love me? That sounds unreasonable. So I, I've tried to understand, God, what it, you, you set a boundary for my relationship with you. Help me to understand how boundaries work. Here's the deal. There's no healthy relationship without boundaries. Let me say that again because you got to get that. There are no healthy relationships without boundaries. When Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments, he was reinforcing everything that God had been revealing him about himself from the beginning of creation. And that was this. I have, I have knowledge that you do not have, and I love, you, I love you more than you love yourself. And if you love me, you're going to trust me. And if you trust me, then you're going to trust the boundaries that I have established in our relationship. Now, you push that a little further. What it teaches us about relationships is this, is when I violate the boundaries that exist in my relationships, you know what I'm telling people who've established those boundaries? I don't love you. When my wife sets a boundary in our relationship and I push past that boundary, you know what I'm telling her? I'm telling her I love myself more than I love you. If I have a friend who sets a boundary and I constantly violate that boundary, you know what I tell that person? I love myself more than I love you. We say we're going to meet at 3 o'clock for coffee, and I get there at 4 o'clock. And I mean, that happens once, but then the next time a month later, we, we're going to meet at 3 o'clock, and I get there at 3.45. And then the next month, I get there at 4.15. Oh, that's my culture, pastor. That's just the way it is. You know what it is? What it is, is I set a boundary in, 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 in my life with this person. And what I'm teaching them is that I love myself more than I love them. Oh, now I'm right, right where we're living. This is just a little nugget today. You teach people how to treat you. And you teach people how you want to be treated. You teach people what you believe about boundaries. You teach people what you believe about them by how you interact with the boundaries that exist in your relationship. 
remember back when we were having a good time with this sermon? I'm not sure I'm with you on this, Pastor. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says this. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skipping down. Chapter 15, I mean, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Think about it for a moment. God created the Garden of Eden. That was perfect, bountiful, full of blessing, life, good things. And he set one boundary, one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, Adam, don't eat of that tree. It's not for you. Everything, everything else here is for you. That one thing will hurt you. It's beyond you. You weren't created for that because you're not God. So you can't handle the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You don't need, ooh, you got to get this. You don't need to wrestle with that. That's not your problem. That's not your burden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You are created with the capacity to have to wrestle with that complexity. But everything else that's here, Adam, it's for you. Enjoy it. Be blessed by it. Find fulfillment in it. Work the ground. Find fulfillment in it. I'm blessing you with all of this. Just this one boundary. Because I have perspective, Adam, as God. I have perspective that you don't have. I know this isn't good for you. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals in The Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree, from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, there's the gotcha moment. Yeah, it's the woman's fault. No, sir, really, if you were a good leader, you would have told her exactly what God said, and so she wouldn't have been confused. So if we want to play these stupid games, then we'll just keep playing these stupid games and fighting and tearing each other down forever. It's not the point of Scripture. Why do we get baited into this? I don't understand. It's not the point at all. So we're not going to play word games. And we're not going to we're not going to hurt each other as brothers and sisters. That's not the point. The point was that we have an enemy of our soul who hates us, hates God, and doesn't want us to live in the bounty and the beauty of what God has provided for us. And you know what he did? You know what he did? He came and he said, "Hey, let me point out The boundary. The one thing. Let me magnify the boundary. Let me tease you into living a life that instead of enjoying the beauty that this relationship provides for you, that you stay focused on that one boundary. Maybe you understand it. Maybe you don't understand it. But in your relationships, if you allow yourself to be fixated on what you can't have... You ruin everything that you do have. 
I have people that I lead in organizations that I serve in. And as their leader, I provide them so much room and space and so much opportunity. But they are miserable. They are miserable in the organization. Because instead of, in, instead of enjoying the blessing of all of the opportunity and the covering and the protection they have to do and try and live out new things, they would rather nag me like a dripping faucet about the one thing that they want to do that right now they're not ready for. And I just want to shake them. I want to say, don't you know that you're loved and that you're valued and that this whole organization is here to serve you and if you would just enjoy it, you can grow and flourish and be blessed and experience far more than you could ever imagine. Don't you know this whole garden is for you. But you're so fixated on that one tree, that one job, that one assignment, that one no, that you can't enjoy it. You're so fixated. You're so fixated on the fact that mom and dad won't let you have a cell phone. Because they look at you and they say, you know what, as a 15-year-old, you're not ready for Instagram. That's set up to kill you and destroy you and rob you and lie to you, and so I'm not going to let you have it. And so you're mad and you're bitter and you're angry because mom and dad are smart and wise and have set boundaries in your life that are for your good. And so instead of enjoying and celebrating all of the blessings that they provided for you, you're living embittered as a teenager because they've set a boundary for you that you don't have the perspective yet to understand. Can I keep going? In our Yeah, you want me to go toward them. I know what you're doing. But we could, we could get it right down to where we're living, right? Some of us are miserable at work because we have a boss that set a boundary that maybe we don't understand or maybe we do understand, but we're just mad because we're not getting what we want. And we're miserable. We're miserable. And maybe... Maybe, just maybe, it has nothing to do with injustice, and maybe it has nothing to do with oppression. Maybe it has to do with you're not the smartest person in the world. Maybe it has to do with you. There are things that you don't know yet and you don't understand. Maybe it has to do with the fact that you're not the one who invested millions of rands and have them on the line for that company. They do. Maybe there's, there, maybe there's a lot going on that you don't know about. Here's the thing. In my relationships, I have to make a choice. I have to make a choice. Am I going to stay fixated on the boundary, running into the wall all of the time, or am I going to turn around and enjoy the blessing? Eve and Adam got tricked into a conversation in which they fixated on the one thing that they didn't have instead of all that they did have. See, boundaries, here's what the Lord is teaching me. I told you that verse from Jesus earlier, which is actually an amplification of what's been said in Scripture over and over again. What the Lord is teaching me about relationship is this. Boundaries are an expression of love built on trust. How do I have a healthy marriage? How do I have a healthy marriage? You have a healthy marriage when you have trust. And without trust, you can't have boundaries. You have a healthy marriage when you have trust. What did the enemy do? The enemy undermined Adam and Eve's trust in the motivation and intentions of God. This is probably important for you to know in your relationships. When you're always pushing the boundaries, do you realize that what you're communicating to the people that you're in relationship with, what you're communicating to them is I don't trust you. When you won't settle for the answer, when you've been given the answer and you just keep pushing and pushing and dripping faucet and dripping faucet and dripping faucet 
You're like the wife in Proverbs where the husband says, let me go, let me go climb up onto the corner of the roof to get so far away from this relationship because, because this person is teaching me. This person is teaching me that it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter the garden that I provide. It doesn't matter the opportunities that I've given. It doesn't matter the sacrifices that I've made. It's never enough. And they don't trust me. And they're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run away. I'm going to find the corner of a roof somewhere just to get some peace. Is it possible that relationships break down in our lives. Some of us just, some of us, some of us, we really are fighting for, um, we're fighting for things that have happened uh, to us in our past or about our past or, 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 or we're fighting for our place in the world or we're, we're living out of our hurt, but we don't, here's what I want you to understand. We don't, we don't understand what it's doing to our relationships. We don't understand that some of our relationships are safe spaces. There are people who genuinely love us and care about us and we're pushing them away because we're always pushing the boundaries. And perhaps, perhaps there are people who are abusive in your life and perhaps there are people in your life who've taken advantage of you and perhaps there are unhealthy relationships and that's, a, that's another conversation. Perhaps there are healthy relationships or people who really do love you and care about you, but you're not aware of the fact that the fact that you always push the boundary, that you always focus on what you don't have, when you're always stubborn and hard-headed about what they've asked or required of you, what you're communicating to them is really not what's in your heart because what's in your heart is that you do love them and you do want relationship with them and you do trust them, but you're not aware of the fact that just like Jesus made it plain and clear when he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. You could also understand that what that means is if you really love someone, you honor, you honor their boundaries. Resisting and rejecting boundaries rob you of the blessing that relationship is meant to provide for you. Resisting and rejecting boundaries rob you of the blessing that relationships are meant to provide for you. Some of us here today are not enjoying the fullness of the relationships that we have because we spend our time and energy resisting and rejecting boundaries that are for our good. Some of us are confused and conflicted in our relationships because there are people who are pushing away from us because we are teaching them that we don't trust them. And we're teaching them that we love ourselves more than we love them. And we're teaching them that what they've given and what they've provided and what they offer is never enough. But here's the thing. Jesus offers to you, and he offers to me a grace and a love that says, you know what? I've got you covered. We talked about it last Sunday. And in loving, healthy relationships, we treat each other with grace and peace. But I need you to hear me, and I'll make this statement and close today. Grace is a gift. But just because it's free doesn't mean doesn't mean that it didn't cost something. See, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they broke relationship with God because they violated boundaries. And because of the violation of those boundaries, they pushed out of relationship. And it took Jesus coming and dying on the cross for your sin and my sin to restore that relationship. And he offers his sacrifice, his shed blood for your sin and my sin as an act of grace, as a free gift. But it doesn't mean that it was cheap and easy. 
It actually cost everything. See, what we have to understand is in our relationships, there's going to be times, there's going to be times where we give, where we offer grace. There's also times when we receive grace. And when we receive grace, we receive it as a free gift, but we need to acknowledge it. We need to acknowledge it for what it is, an act of great value. 